Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I am Michael Bull, and I'm so glad you are with us. This segment is brought to you by Apto.com. Check them out if you're in the commercial real estate brokerage business. You'll be glad you did. Now, today we're going to talk about the hotel industry. You know, it's kind of an interesting industry because you have nightly leases, right? A lot of things we talk about in the commercial real estate show have long leases and things can take longer to move, but the hotel industry can move a little faster. We have a great guest for you. Please welcome uh, Michael Belisario. He is senior research analyst and he's VP with Baird and he's joining us on the phone today. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. So let's talk about the, the, the hotel industry as a whole you know the uh, seems like we've been in a great cycle for a while where are we in the cycle for the hotel industry yeah that's a great question and that, that's the one everyone wants an answer to uh, it, it certainly feels like we are later cycle uh, definitely experiencing later cycle dynamics supply growth has picked up rev par growth uh, which is the key metric for the industry revenue per, per available room has slowed we're in this low single digit uh, growth environment uh, but certainly things that I would describe them as good not great across the board and you know if you think about where we're at in the cycle things bottomed in in 10 and they they turn from negative to positive and we're, we're in year nine now of this up cycle and we haven't had cycles this long before which which makes people a little bit nervous mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the election uh, changed sentiment uh, in late 16 uh, tax reform in the, the late summer of last year certainly uh, added to that positive sentiment. I think people are upbeat, cautiously optimistic is, is a good way to describe it, but overall fundamentals uh, on a high level view, good, but not great because it's not 2012, 2013, 2014 when things are growing five, six, seven, eight percent. We're in this one, two, three percent top line growth environment. Okay. And what is growing and what's not growing? How about business travel is uh, maybe the sentiment there because businesses seem to be excited, small business seems to be excited, or is it uh, vacation uh, growth? What, what do you see? Yeah, it's, it's the leisure traveler that mm -hmm. continues to be strong. They were strong throughout the downturn mm -hmm. and continue to travel. If you think about where employment levels are at, everyone has a job. People are going on vacation. People are spending money. Uh, travel is becoming a, a more important part of uh, individuals and families' budgets and plans. Uh, so it's it's really the leisure traveler that has remained strongest this cycle. Uh, you would think with uh, the stock market you know, at at or near all time highs, continuing to make new all time highs, corporate profitability reaching new highs, that the business traveler would actually be stronger. That's not the case. We describe the business traveler as a little squishy. <laughs> Demand is there, um, but everyone's very price sensitive. Everyone is watching their bottom line, their travel and entertainment expenses. People are traveling, but they're going for one or two days instead of two or three days uh, to a conference, for example. Uh, everyone's being asked to do more with less, so every day you're out of the office. Uh, the, the work just piles up. So pe people are being more thoughtful about travel on the business side, it's not only a, uh, an individual decision, but it's coming down from the sea level where that's a line item in a slow growth environment that you could manage and, and, and travel and entertainment gets cut back a little bit. So it, it, it's solid, but it's squishy because it, it hasn't really picked up or re-accelerated like a lot of people would have thought. And I think that comes back to hotel rooms are expensive. If you're traveling for business, you're mostly going to New York, Boston, San Francisco, Chicago, all the urban gateway markets. And hotel rooms every night are two, three, four, five hundred dollars or more a night, and that adds up quickly. So um, it, it's really the leisure traveler that continues to remain strong. The business transient uh, traveler is there, but, but price sensitive. And then the other piece of the pie is group business. Think conferences, conventions, uh, association business remain solid, not necessarily accelerating or decelerating. A lot of that business is on the books farther out. So events that are happening this year may have gotten booked two or three years ago. But what we're seeing is a lot more shorter-term group business 
because companies are cognizant of their quarterly results, and if they're not going to hit their numbers or, or they're not ahead of budget, they're going to delay that March group until maybe April or later in the year when they have more clarity with, with their budgets. And then we're also seeing groups look further out, too. So the booking window is actually shrinking but also expanding at the same time because everyone's traveling, occupancies are at all-time highs, there's no space to put these people, so you have to look further out. So uh, interesting dynamic going on on the group side, but if I had to stack rank them, leisure traveler, definitely the strongest, then group is kind of the steady eddy, and then the business traveler is, is the, the squishy one that I described. Okay. I love squishy. That's the first force, Michael. I like that one. <laughs> you, you, you can keep using that one if you'd like. <laughs> Thank you very much. So how is all of that impacting the various hotel types? Really, you know, is full service uh, working differently than limited or resorts? What do you see there? Yeah, re resorts are definitely the strongest. And some of that is just year-to-date performance. If you look at the numbers, um, it's skewed a little bit because of the, it's skewed positively because of the hurricanes and the hotels that are closed in the Caribbean. If you think about people wanting to go on vacations in January or spring break trips in, in March, the Caribbean, there's not a lot of hotels open there after the hurricane, so the alternative is Florida or Southern California or Phoenix, Scottsdale or other beach type of uh, destinations. So those markets, those hotels have done extraordinarily well year to date. Um, and it's not just year to date outperformance, it's just been uh, exaggerated recently. Um, but the, the select service versus full service debate is interesting because I think the lines between full and select service are getting blurred. Historically, select service was always associated with secondary markets, tertiary markets, airport hotels, side of the highway hotels, and full service was your downtown CBD convention hotel. Mm -hmm. It's not really the case anymore. All the hotels, or almost all the hotels that are being built are you know, 20, 30 story select service hotels in urban gateway markets. So uh, we're seeing more supply for those uh, that type of hotel come online, but that's because the math works for a developer. You don't have to have the three restaurants, the ballrooms, all the meeting space. The math just works. And as costs continue to rise, both on the labor uh, and material side, land costs, land costs go up, the select service business model from a development return perspective just makes more sense. And on top of it, I think the customer today is more receptive to a courtyard in New York City. It, it took a while because everyone assumes courtyard residents in Hilton Garden Inn, secondary market, airport, hotel, lower quality, but that's not the case at all. So the, it, it, there's a paradigm shift that's going on from both a owner and developer perspective, but also how the consumers see and view the brands. And frankly, at the end of the day, New and shiny always beats old, dull, and stinky. And if you're building more newer select service hotels, chances are when you go online and look at the pictures or use your phone to compare prices, the, the new Hyatt place, for example, is probably going to look and screen better than the old 25-year-old Marriott hotel that still has the yellows, browns, and reds in the room. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, you were very quotable there. Better than old and stinky. <laughs> I like that. Um, how are you mentioned construction costs going up and it's impacting a lot of uh, uh, the market, commercial real estate market around the country and around the world. Um, how is our rising construction costs impacting the hotel uh, world? And, you know, because you, uh, one of the things you have the, the PIP, right? When, when somebody changes ownership, uh, we're selling some hotels now and just for one small hotel, it's a, I think the PIP's a million one hundred thousand dollars. What do you see there? Yeah, costs are going up. And it's making underwriting, both from an acquisition perspective, right, if you have a PIP, or really the development side, much more expensive. And if you go on a list of development, hotels are always the most expensive, or almost always the most expensive real estate um, class to build, given all the FF&E build out. And it's the high, highest risk and highest return. However, when costs go up, people adjust their discount rates in, in their underwriting. So what we're seeing is, a plateauing of uh, new starts, projects getting delayed, um, not necessarily getting scrapped, but the math doesn't work like it used to. It doesn't pencil the way it, it used to 24 months ago because costs might be 10% higher, 
180 days later from when you last did your pro forma. So wow. I think the silver lining is that from an owner perspective, we're seeing national supply growth start to plateau around 2%. Um, and it's not only projects taking longer to open because there's always delays, always cost overruns. It's just the next project that the person is thinking about, that same developer, they're thinking a little bit harder about it because the math doesn't pencil like it used to and the returns aren't as good. So it's, it's affecting everyone. And, and to your point on the renovation side, renovation costs continue to go up on a like-for-like -like basis. And as rev par growth has slowed, margins remain pressured. That just further eats into the cash flow and the profitability of a hotel, and that makes the underwriting that much more difficult too. So it's, it's impactful. It's slow moving. It's something that on the development side we talk about today, but we really won't see the impact for two or three years. So you, you have to kind of look ahead a little bit. But it's certainly a silver lining from an, from an owner's perspective that supply growth is, is starting to taper a little bit. Yeah. Well, Michael, uh, what do you see from the investor standpoint? How do investors look at the hotel sector today compared to some of the other sectors? It's a good question. From, from the public market perspective, I think everyone is nervous that we're late cycle. That, that's what we hear from real estate dedicated investors, from hedge fund guys, from consumer generalist type of investors. It's not that the cycle is long in the tooth, but it, it's definitely later cycle. Rev par growth has slowed. Costs continue to rise. And in a capital intensive business, as I mentioned, bottom line profitability can be flat to negative for some of these portfolios that, uh, that are especially focused in urban markets. So th there, there's some caution there. Um, it, I think today we're on better footing and sentiment and expectations are probably more balanced, I think, than they have been basically right up to the election. Right after the election, everyone got excited about a growth reacceleration. Then we kind of plateaued. And then with tax reform, we went from the back burner to the front burner in, in late August and tax reform got done. Everyone got excited again about a reacceleration. We have yet to see that. So I think people are getting a little bit tired of that. And is the reacceleration really going to happen? And if it does, maybe we go from two or three percent to three or four percent. Is that is that enough to get uh, over that operating um, threshold and, and create some bottom line leverage? The answer is maybe, but I don't think investors are really willing to pay for that right now. The other thing to consider too is, especially on the REIT side. There is this high-level view that interest rates are going to continue to rise. Now, we've seen the 10-year go from roughly 2% to 3%. Frankly, the, the big move has probably already been made. We're, we're not really going from 3 to 4 here in another 3 to 6 months like we saw on a backward-looking basis. But that's how people think. And any stock that has the name REIT in it, whether it's a hotel REIT or an industrial REIT or a healthcare REIT, right? the, the, the thought process is, is you sell utilities, you sell REITs, and you buy financials in other economically sensitive names because when rates go up, the thought process is that economic growth is accelerating. And we, we've seen that. The, the real estate index, all the subsectors have been relative underperformers for the last 12 plus months. Uh, even with hotels, thinking that growth is going to accelerate, there, there are you know, fits and starts there with outperformance. But, but overall, you're kind of swimming upstream because the capital flows are coming out of the real estate space and they're moving into other sectors and people aren't really looking at fundamentals it's all interest rate fears and, and fears of rising interest rates and you sell REITs you sell utilities and you buy banks and other stocks that, that that's the trade that's occurred the last 12 months yeah that's interesting well Michael what do you see for trends related to property level values yeah that's so we, we talked about plateauing and slowing rev par growth and tough margins What's interesting is property values continue to go up. Um, there is an abundant amount of debt and equity capital on the sidelines chasing deals. The REITs are looking for deals that are all well capitalized. There's just not a lot for sale because if you're a seller, why sell? I can refinance. I think the biggest thing supporting valuations, not just for hotels, but across all real estate property types, and I think is probably one of the biggest risks uh, uh, on the macro side, you know, that we don't have another repeat of late 15, early 16 when the, the credit market tighten up. It's, it's the white hot debt markets continue to support valuations. If you're a levered buyer, you can lever up 
four, four and a half percent cost of debt to 70, 75 percent LTV. And the math works because hotels are higher cap rate assets and you can clip double digit year one cash on cash returns. And that's still pretty attractive today. Now, there's a residual value risk there. What do you sell it for in a couple of years? Where's the cycle at? But uh, I think I don't want to say people are ignoring that, but they're more focused on the initial returns than they are on the back end. And that has supported real estate values broadly. Secondary markets, tertiary markets, select service hotels, low rev park hotels, high end hotels, resorts. It's kind of across the board, and it's amazing that fundamentals have plateaued, but it's it's really the debt market that continues to support valuations, and frankly, you know, have them continue to inch higher. Yeah, well, that's good news, I guess, uh, if you're an owner uh, or investor in uh, in the hotel industry. So, Michael, great information. Thanks for joining us today. You bet. Thanks for having me, Michael. And that's uh, Michael Balisario, and he's Senior Research Analyst and VP with Baird. And if you like their website, it's rwbaird.com. Well, stay with us. We're going to have, have more on the hotel industry around the U.S. Stay with us. I'm Michael Bull. This is America's Commercial Real Estate Show.